and you are our honored guest. And uh, thank you so much for being and worshiping the Lord with us this morning. We are going to have a fellowship after our service. We have Timbits and coffee and tea. We want you to stay and, and be a part of that and uh, fellowship with us this morning uh, for a little bit. Romans chapter 7 in your Bible. In your Bibles, we'll begin our reading in verse number 1. Romans chapter 7 and verse number 1. I'll begin this message this morning, and then I'm going to continue it tonight. And so you need to come back tonight to hear the conclusion of it. Uh, but the message was too long for um, for one service, and uh, the thought is kind of one thought. So I want to bring it together. And so tonight we'll finish this thought: serving in newness of spirit. Romans chapter seven, verse number one. The Bible says, "Know ye not, brethren? For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath." Have dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore ye brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. I want you to notice the expression that we find in verse 6 of our text. The Bible says that we should serve in newness of spirit. That we should serve in newness of spirit. Let's pray, can we? Father, I pray you would help us as we look at your word this morning. I pray that you would speak to our hearts and I pray you would hide me behind the cross. I pray, Father in heaven, that you'd give me the words to say. I pray, Heavenly Father, you would guide my mouth and my mind. I pray you would bind Satan and his demons. I pray your word would fall on good ground. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give us spiritual application for our life this morning to direct us and to guide us into truth. I pray, Father in heaven, that you would bless every good decision. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was 10 years old, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And... Uh, I grew up in a Christian home. Um, I've always, what my parents would say, I've always been a good kid and never really got in any trouble. Uh, but there was a lot that I didn't understand about the Christian life and, and about the Bible. And as I got older and grew up in church, I, I began to understand. You know, I, I never really had a, a, an evil, bad background. But even after a 10-year-old boy, after, after trusting Christ as my Savior, something changed in my life. I started to desire the Word of God. I started to uh, desire to know more what God had to say. Now, don't get me wrong, I was never a perfect kid and, and uh, not a perfect adult, but I desired to know God in a greater way. At 18, I felt God's calling upon my life to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and uh, to minister in a way that He sees fit. And so I went to Bible college. And uh, at 18, and, and after finishing Bible college, I came to Kitchener Baptist Church and for six years was assistant to uh, Dr. Phil Clayton. And then uh, this is coming up to my fifth year of pastoring. And I've learned many things over five years of pastoring and then also as assistant pastor for six years. I've learned that people have struggles. I, I learned that people have have uh, hurts and, and heartaches in their heart and and uh, some people are struggling, struggling with various things. I, I've learned that we're involved in a spiritual battle and that the devil is real and the devil desires to have all of us to sift us as wheat and to destroy us. But I love the Bible scripture where it says that Jesus has prayed for us, that our faith faileth not. And when we are converted, strengthen our, our brother. Sadly, a lot of Christians uh, don't realize they're engaged in a spiritual battle until it is too late. All of us need encouragement. All of us need that, that push in our life, that help in our life to keep on moving forward, to keep on going, that guidance to, to help us in our Christian life. 
the reality is a lot of us don't understand what we have in Jesus Christ, the victory that we have in Jesus Christ and our identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. A woman owned a parrot that could say only one thing, and that one thing was, who is it? For years and years, she tried to teach the bird to extend its vocabulary, but it refused to utter anything other than, who is it? One day, the woman sent for a, a plumber to fix some pipes in her house, and because she had to go out shopping, she arranged for him to find the key under the mat outside of the front door. The, the plumber uh, arrived and, and uh, found the key, let himself in, and began his work. Naturally, the, the parrot hearing someone in the house that was unfamiliar began uh, to, to say, who is it? Who is it? Called the, the parrot. And the plumber called it the workman. Hearing a strange voice, the, the, the parrot again decided to utter his one and only phrase, who is it? And the plumber said the workman. The parrot was not satisfied. He wanted to see who the stranger was. And so he kept saying, who is it? Who is it? He called again and again, and the plumber again and again said, it's the plumber, it's the plumber, it's the plumber. Frustrated, the plumber ran all through the house looking for this voice, this individual who was asking, who is it? And he couldn't find anyone, not thinking that it was the, the plumber. Finally, he grew, grew in, increasingly desperate and and, and shouting out, it's the plumber, it's the plumber, that he passed out in the hallway of the house. Just at that moment, the woman of the house entered, saw the unconscious figure on the carpet and said, who is it? And the parrot replied, it's the plumber. <laughs> <laughs> who are we in Jesus Christ is what Paul is trying to describe for us. We are no longer under the dominion of sin. We have freedom in Christ. Who are we is what Paul is trying to get us to understand. We are a Christian. We have victory in the Lord. In verses 1 to 3 in our text, Paul paints a grim picture of the law and what it is like to be under that law. For one, to live under the law would mean that they would remain under the law until death. The law would have dominion over them as long as they lived. That's what the Bible says. And Paul gives to us the picture of marriage. A husband and a wife is the example given, and it speaks of their union. The meaning is, as death dissolves the connection between a wife and her husband, and of course the obligation of the law resort, uh, resulting from that connection, so the death of the Christian to the law dissolves that connection. So far as the scope of the arrangement here is concerned and prepares the way for another union, that union is with the Lord Jesus Christ, and, which, and, and with that new union, we find this opportunity that springs up from this union with the Lord Jesus. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear. If you look at our text, verse number four, it says, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We were bound to sin by the law. If I could paint this picture, we were married to sin, or we had this union with sin. But in Jesus Christ, in the gospel, in the death of Jesus Christ, there is freedom from sin. There is freedom from death, verse 5. And now we have union with Jesus. We are in Christ. We are married to Christ, is the thought. And therefore, we have victory in Jesus Christ. We have divorced the law. We have married the Lord Jesus, or in union with Jesus Christ. And we have victory in Christ. That's what the picture that Paul is painting. The law would say that you have sinned, therefore you must die. The law would say that sin will dominate your life and control your life until death. The law will say that sin will be your master. But the law of grace says, I've paid your sin debt. The law of grace says that I've given you life in me. The law of grace says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Sin does not have dominion over the child of God. We have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. And a whole lot has changed 
in the life of a child of God. You see, the law denotes obligation. But in the law of grace, it denotes opportunity. And that's a wonderful thing. We are living in the, in the age of grace, and by the grace of God, we are saved. By the grace of God, we are born again. By the grace of God, we have salvation. And we see the love of God as we sang about this morning, about Calvary and about God's love displayed upon us on the cross. We see the love of God displayed before us. And this love ought to compel us to serve God more than what the law could ever do to compel us to love God and to live a life that honors him. But number verse number six in our text is really my message. And it, it really does, as we consider this thought, it really does jump out at me as a wonderful thought as we move forward in these days. The Bible says in verse six, but now we are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And I want to take a moment and consider this thought, if we could. I want to consider this thought. What does it mean? I, 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 was, once, I was once a master to sin and to the law. I was once on my way to hell. I was once lost and undone. And now I'm a child of God. And the Bible says that now I serve him in newness of spirit. What does it mean for my Christian life and my life? What does it mean in this change in my life to serve the Lord in newness of spirit? And so we're going to begin with point number one this morning and then point number two and point number three tonight. I hope you'll come back and at least hear the conclusion of this, of this message, serving God in newness of spirit. So number one. You'll find an outline uh, in your bulletin this morning. You can follow along with us. Number one, I want us to see the meaning of this thought. The meaning, number one, verse six, but now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that speaks of the bondage, this prison that we were held, the law was our prison house, but now we are free from this. We are free from the master of sin and the consequence of sin, and now we can serve God in a different dynamic. Now we can serve God in a different dynamic. We serve him in newness of spirit. What does it mean in this age as we serve the Lord? Well, A, there in your notes, we see the Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit. We, we need to understand what the Bible teaches about the Holy Spirit. When you got saved, the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior, then Jesus moved into your life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And the Spirit of God is God's down payment for the work that he will complete in your life. The Holy Spirit moved into your life. He is the comforter. The Bible says he directs us, he convicts us, he guides us into all truth. And so let's, if we could go to Romans chapter eight and move forward, just one chapter, Romans chapter eight. And, and notice what the Bible says, Romans chapter eight, and verse 13, if we could look there together, Romans 8, verse 13. The Bible says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit of God is in us, those who trust Jesus as our Savior. And now there's a different dynamic and a different relationship in the life of a, a born-again believer. Now they look at God as their their, their daddy is the thought here, Abba, Father, Daddy. There's an endearing relationship between man and God as they come to Christ as their Savior. Verse 16, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, we, uh, that we may be also glorifying Together, We see this relationship that takes place in the life of a Christian. We are led by the Spirit of God in our life. The Spirit of God wants to have 
first place, wants to have ruling power, wants to direct us and guide us and, 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 and uh, give us wisdom in the decisions that we make as we yield to him and submit to him. And the Bible says that if an individual does not have this leading of the Spirit, does not have the Spirit of God in their life, then they are not a child of God. God gives to the Christian his Spirit, and his Spirit convicts us of our sin. His Spirit guides us into all truth. He is leading us to live a sanctified and a holy life for Jesus Christ. Jesus said it with his own lips, I will not leave you comfortless. And uh, the thought there is another comforter, is another of the same. As Jesus led and guided his disciples, as Jesus taught his disciples, another of the same would, be, uh, would enter into the life of a Christian. And so, the Holy Spirit guides us and leads us into all truth. And so we have the Spirit of God, as we think of this dynamic, we have the Spirit of God to help us to live godly in a godless world. Now, let's turn, if we could, to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Notice what the Word of God says. Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 22. Galatians chapter 5. And verse number 22. Galatians 5, verse 22. The Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Now, notice this expression against such, there is no law, there is no obligation here. You say, What, what do you mean? There is no law to fulfill these things in your life. In fact, the fruits of the Spirit are just the outward expression of a Christian submitting to God and yielding to God, and the Spirit of God is expressing Himself in the life of a believer and being seen in the life of the believer as He has control in the life of a Christian. And so there's a yielding, and then there's an outward expression of these fruits and that's what the Bible says, love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and, and, and faith and meekness and temperance. That would be control. Here, these are not commanded, but they are, they are seen or they're fruits that are seen in the life of a Christian who lives for God and walks, for, walks with God and yields themselves to the Spirit of God in their life. And so this is important. The Spirit of God is doing a work in our life. The Spirit of God is guiding us in our life. And we're going to talk about this in just a moment. But I want to go to the second thought, and that's the letter B there, and that's our spirit. That's our spirit. Now, the Bible says that we serve in a newness of spirit. And, and verse 16 of Romans chapter 8 tells us that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So there's something that happens in our attitude, in our spirit as well. And uh, we, we find out what the Bible teaches us. I want you to turn to John chapter 3, if you could turn there. I want to really give to you this thought. Number one in your notes, our spirit is dead. Our spirit is dead. We are spiritually dead, the Bible teaches us. And, and the great illustration of that is found in John chapter 3, in the story of Jesus confronting Nicodemus. When a person comes to Jesus, they are born again spiritually. Look what the Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse number 5. John chapter 3, verse number 5. I want you to see this text this morning. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. John 3, verse 5. Jesus answered. He's speaking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is asking a question. And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now people say, well, what is water? What, what is Spirit? What is he talking about? Well, the Bible is our best commentary, and it defines for us what he's talking about in the, in the very next verse, in verse 6. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that which I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So think about this. In order to enter into the kingdom of God, one must, one must be born physically, born of water, and then one must be born spiritually, born of the Spirit. You see, when we are born physically, we are born spiritually dead. 
That's what the Bible teaches us. In verse number 6, Jesus makes that clear. He said, Nicodemus, think about this. I'm not talking about a physical problem here. That which is of the flesh is flesh. He's separating the physical from the spiritual. But that which is of the spirit is spirit. This is a spiritual problem, and it needs to be solved spiritually. Jesus Christ is the answer to our spiritual problem. Through Jesus, our spirit is born again. Now think about this. Let's move into Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Look what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 2 and the very first verse. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse number 1. Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says it this way. Verse number 1, Ephesians 2. And you, speaking of the Christian here, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you're born again, this is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. And you, he says, have he quickened. The word quickened there means to be made alive. Who were dead and in trespasses, were dead in trespasses and sins. So we were born into this world with a sinful nature. We were spiritually dead. That's what the Bible teaches us. Jesus told Nicodemus, if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, there must be a physical birth, but that's not going to solve a spiritual problem. And so what you need to do is be born spiritually, and that is only going to happen through the Lord Jesus Christ. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, saw a spiritual condition of humanity, and so he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will have everlasting life. There is the spiritual problem, that which is of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not what I say unto thee. Don't mix this up, Nicodemus. You must be spiritually born again. Why? Because we are dead in our sins. All of humanity is dead in their sins. And they need to be quickened or they need to be made alive. And this happens in Jesus Christ. Now, think about this. When we trusted the Lord Jesus as our Savior, we serve Him in newness of spirit because now our spirit is born again. It's made alive. And so now we have life. We have a pulse. We have a spiritual heartbeat now. And we feel and, and, and we, have, we have these desires to know God and to follow God. We have new life in Jesus is what the Bible's teaching us. Now let me give you another thought if I could. Number two there in your notes. We were also spiritually discerned. We were also spiritually discerned. Now turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 14. Look what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. It's, it's wonderful to hear the Bible's turning. You know, there's a lot of churches today that you don't hear the Bible opened at all. It's great to hear the Word of God being opened. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, but the natural man, that expression there, the natural man, that is the natural man, that is how man is born into this world. Naturally, they have a sinful nature. Naturally, they are dead in their sin. The natural man, that's speaking about the unsaved man, the one who does not have Jesus Christ as their Savior. But the natural man, the unsaved man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. To be discerned is to see and to identify by noting a difference or differences. To know the distinctive character of, to discriminate, to distinguish, to see by the eye or by the understanding, to perceive, to recognize as, to discern a difference. And this comes from Webster's Dictionary 1913. And by that definition, he puts Proverbs 7.7. 7, and beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. You see, the Bible says that an unsaved world, they are spiritually discerned. Let's continue reading in verse number 15. But he that is spiritual, remember, we're talking about being made alive. 
Their spirit is alive. An unsaved man, their spirit is dead. They don't have that heartbeat. They don't have that spiritual pulse. But the one who comes to Jesus, they are made alive in Jesus. They are now spiritual. They judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged by no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? That's a question that we all need to know. Now notice this. The one who knows Jesus as their Savior. But we have the mind of Christ. But we have the mind of Christ. You see, as Christians, we have His Spirit. We have His mind, the views of God, the feelings of God, the temper of Christ. We are influenced by the Spirit of God, and therefore we have the very mind of Christ. But the unsafe person cannot discern that which is good or evil. He cannot discern that which pleases God or displeases God. He doesn't understand the Bible. In fact, God said it is foolishness unto him. Let me give you some scriptures. Let's see if we could go to 1 Corinthians, turn back to chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 18. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Jump down to verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block because they seek for a sign, and unto the Gentiles or the Greeks foolishness because they seek after wisdom. You see, I want us to understand this as we think about this serving God and newness of spirit, that once we were spiritually dead, Therefore, we were spiritually discerned, and an unsaved man, the Bible says, is spiritually discerned. To an unsaved man, he doesn't understand all that is entailed by the cross. Why would God put men in hell? He doesn't understand about our sin and, and, and why uh, the Bible speaks of sin, that God hates sin, and, and, and Jesus came to this world so that man can be reconciled with God and and they don't understand the Bible. They don't understand the need to read the Word of God. They, they don't have a desire to read the Word of God. They don't have a desire to understand preaching. They don't have to understand a desire for the importance of preaching. It's foolishness to them. Without, without the direction of the Spirit of God and the conviction of the Spirit of God, as the Spirit of God will convict an unsaved man and lead them to the cross. But in their own ability, they don't understand all of those things. They are spiritually discerned. It's what the Bible says. And I want to make this statement I hope will help you. That is why it's dangerous when unsaved men, unsaved men with no testimony of being a child of God would write Christian books about Christian doctrines without the guidance of the Spirit of God and lead Christians in a direction that God doesn't want them to go. Think about that. Think about that. You see, the Bible says in this passage of Scripture that it's dangerous. It is dangerous. We have the mind of Christ. We have the mind of Christ. And God has placed in us the Spirit of God. He is our teacher. He is our guide. We have His Spirit. And therefore, it is our desire to please Him and to follow God. Now, number three there, the purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life. The purpose of the Holy Spirit in my life. What does the Bible say about God's purpose. I want you to turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Look at what the Bible says. John chapter 15, verse 26 in the Bible. John chapter, John chapter 15 and verse number 26. The Bible says, and when the Comforter is come, now this is the purpose of the Spirit of God in our life. When the purpose, when the, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. This is Jesus Christ. And ye shall 
bear witness because ye have been with me from the beginning. Now, Jesus is saying here that the Spirit of God will testify of him. The Lord Jesus will testify of me. And he said, you will know this because you've been with me from the beginning. You know what I'm all about. You know my desires. You know my passions. You know my purpose in my life. And by the way, when someone trusts Jesus as their Savior, the Spirit of God moves in their life, and they have the mind of God. They have the mind of God. The Spirit of God directs them. And, and here, that's what the Bible is saying. You'll have my heartbeat. You'll have my passion. You'll have my desire. You'll have my mind. I give all of this to you so that you can be successful in the Christian life. Now let's jump, if we could, to John chapter 16, verse 13. John chapter 16, verse 13. We're looking at the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. John chapter 16, verse number 13. The Bible says, How be it when he, that's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever ye shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14, he shall glorify me, that's the Lord Jesus, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father are of mine, therefore said I, that ye shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. A little while, verse 16, and ye shall not see me. And again, a little while, and ye shall see me because I go to the Father. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that God glorified Jesus Christ in the task of redemption. The Bible says that God gave Jesus a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. God glorified Jesus Christ. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. But also the Bible makes it clear that Jesus glorified His Father, glorified God by His obedience, by coming to a sin-cursed world, by dying for the sins of this world. But don't miss this, because I believe that so many people misunderstand the role of the Spirit of God in the work of salvation. The Bible says that the Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ, by convicting men of their sin, by drawing them to Christ, and, and through the life of a Christian, by guiding us into all truth. By the way, Jesus Christ is the truth. And I could even go further by saying that the Spirit-filled life or the Spirit-controlled life is a life that bears the fruit of the Spirit. And by bearing the fruit of the Spirit, really what we're going to do is we're going to live and we're going to act like the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as He guides us into all truth, He's going to guide us and draw us into a life that lives and, 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 and acts like the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christ in us, the hope of glory. But the work of the Holy Spirit is to guide us and to direct us to live a holy life that we may shine forth in a dark and perverse world to live like the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I want to give you another thought as we consider the work of the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 3. For the Christian, the Spirit of God is our teacher. He's our teacher. And the Spirit of God is helping us to understand the Word of God and to have the heart of God. Look what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 11. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 11. The Bible says, if by any means I might obtain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I have already obtained, neither were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I'm, I'm not reached spiritual uh, a spiritual pinnacle that I need to stop growing. And by the way, if Paul hasn't reached that pinnacle, then I'm not going to reach that pinnacle and you're not going to reach that pinnacle. In other words, as long as we live on this earth, there's always going to be work to be done in our Christian life. Always work to be done. And Paul says, brother, and I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, and I believe this is how we succeed in the Christian life, what we do is we forget about those things behind us. And that's, by the way, our failures and our victories. And we press forward to the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And the prize is always the Lord Jesus. Let us therefore, verse 15, 
as many as be perfect, the thought there is mature. So as many as are mature Christians, grown up believers, we could say, established believers, rooted, he says to the church of Colossae, rooted believers, he says, be thus minded, have this mind to strive forward, to forget about our victories and forget about our failures, but keep on pressing forward. There's more growing to do. There's more ground to gain. Keep moving forward is his thought. And he said that those who are mature in Christ, his prayer is that they would be thus minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, here's what he's saying. If, if this is not your attitude, if this is not your mind, Look what he says. God shall reveal even this unto you. God, the Holy Spirit of God, in the life of a believer is our guide. He's guiding us into all truth. You know, we talk about transformations in our heart. We talk about our fellowship. We talk about our uh, being guided by the Spirit of God. We serve Him now in newness of spirit. You see, the reality is we have the Holy Spirit in our life. And where once our spirit was dead and we were spiritually discerned, now we have a spiritual pulse and now we have a spiritual heartbeat and now we feel and now we have the mind of God and the Spirit of God is our teacher and the Spirit of God is convicting us and saying, hey, you shouldn't do that and hey, you should be doing that and hey, this is what you need to do and hey, this is my word and he uses the Bible and it comes alive because it is quick and it is powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword and it reaches down to the soul and it reaches down to the bones and it reaches down to even the spiritual aspect of our life and the spirit of God uses the very living word of God to direct us and to convict us so that we would be like Jesus upon this earth that's what the Bible teaches us a park ranger at Yellowstone National Park was leading a group of hikers to a fire lookout the ranger was so intent on telling the hikers uh, uh, excuse me about the flowers and the animals and that he decided to turn off his two-way radio because he said it was just an interruption to him. As the group neared the tower, the ranger was met, met by a, a, a nearly breathless lookout uh, who, who uh, asked why he hadn't responded to his two-way radio messages. And he said, well, I turned it off. It was just a bother. I was busy talking about the trees and the birds, and I was busy talking about all of the beauty of this, of this, uh, of this park. He said, well, there's a grizzly bear that's been stalking the group, and We've been trying to warn you for about three miles now. You see, the Bible tells us that when we ignore the Spirit of God, when we ignore the Spirit's guidance, when we ignore the Word of God in our life, then we are heading for danger. But now we are delivered from the law that we should, being dead, we're in where we are held, that's the bondage of the law, we should serve in newness of spirit. God has given you everything as a child of God. He has given you everything that you need and I need to be successful. We have victory in Christ. The law has no more dominion. We are not under the condemnation of sin. We have the Spirit of God in us, the mind of God. We have His living Word. We have His local church. We have everything that we need in our life to live a successful Christian life. And my friend, today I ask you, would you follow the guidance of God in your life today? Would you listen to the Spirit's call? Would you listen to the Spirit's voice as He uses the Bible to guide you and direct you? If you are not saved today, if you are not born again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, God's invitation is for you today. Through His Word, you must be born again. Oh, Pastor, I, you don't understand. I've been baptized, or I've been confirmed, or I'm a part of this church, or I'm a good person. Hey, listen, don't fight a physical problem. Uh, don't fight a, a physical solution with a spiritual problem. The spiritual solution is Jesus is the only way to heaven. If you are to be born again, it is through Jesus and Jesus alone. I pray that you would call upon the name of the Lord and that you would be saved. Listen, friend, it's straight from the Word of God. It's not my opinion. I'm not twisting the Bible. This is straight from the Word of God. This is God's message to you today. The Spirit of God, is, if He is convicting you, hey, listen today, don't grieve the Spirit of God. Don't turn away from His message. I pray today that you would trust Him as your Savior. And Christian, today I pray, 
wherever you are in your life today, I pray that you would listen to the Spirit's call. We're going to finish this message tonight. I hope you'll come as we conclude the rest of this message, serving the Lord in newness of spirit. Let's pray. Can we, Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your word and, Lord, for the message that we have. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would guide and direct us. And, Father, I, I thank you for your word, and I thank you, Lord, for its direction for our life that we can truly understand, uh, Lord, your heart and, and your purpose, and, Lord, your plan in eternal life. And so, Father, I pray if there's an individual here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, I pray, Heavenly Father, that today would be the day of salvation for them. I pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that you would, uh, uh, you would speak to their hearts, convict them, Lord, and I pray for the Christian here, Lord, that may be struggling with something or hurts in their heart. Or, Lord, I pray that they would be sensitive to that Spirit's call, that guidance, that we would be like the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray you would have your way in our invitation time as we talk to you, as we make good decisions that honor you. We thank you for this opportunity. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. No one's looking around. Let's stand if we could. The piano's going to play. If God has spoken to your heart, let's take a time and talk to the Lord.